Good evening, my little phantom. Welcome back to Phantasmic, hosted by none other than moi, Lady Lillian McCubb. Tonight, I wanted to take another look at some of the scariest urban legends. But this week's theme is all about the most infamous of the legends originating online. From the Momo Challenge to Slenderman and even Ben Drowned, let's take a bit of a deeper dive into these dark tales from the web. <laughs> Fun fact, this isn't my first stint into the mortal plane. I was also here to witness the rise of interactive internet horror, but I had to go back to hell for various reasons that might get discussed later. Now that I'm back, however, well, it was quite surprising to see the genuine notoriety of these legends, in all honesty. I thought these had all had their time and that the internet had long since moved on from these silly stories. Yet, here we are with some having gone on to be a legend far more than themselves, and others ongoing still. I alluded briefly to the Momo challenge just now, but really, that was inspired by a similar rumor that happened a couple years prior. The Blue Whale Challenge. Both famed tales share their obvious similarities, including starting off as simple challenges, Attempting to induce self-harm in kids ages 11 to 15. Attempting to bring said young players to suicide. Refusal to play is met with disturbing, gory images. However, where, where they, they differ, differ most is how they start. start. And, and it's at, at this point where I turn my focus to the original of the two, the Blue Whale Challenge. challenge. I, I will, will include a link to some info on the Momo Challenge in the description for those who would like to go ahead and look more into that themselves. But for now, I know it's a crime to quote Wikipedia, but they truly have the history of the Blue Whale put best. In November 2015, a Russian teenager posted a selfie with the caption, Nya Bai, before committing suicide. Her death was then discussed in internet forums and groups, becoming mixed with scare stories and folklore. Further suicides were added to the group story. Soon after, Russian journalist Galina Mersilyeva first wrote about these death groups in an article published in the Russian newspaper Novaya Gazeta in April 2016. The article described F57 groups on Russian social media site VK that she claimed had incited 130 teenagers to commit suicide. Mersilyeva's article was criticized at the time of its release for lacking credible data and balance, with the 130 cases of suicide cited being particularly problematic. The number was originally suggested by the father of one of the teenagers, Sergei Prestov, who came to the figure 130 by using Russian media sources to look for child suicides he believed were linked to online groups. He then produced a brochure which implied that foreign intelligence operatives were responsible for encouraging Russian children to commit suicide. After an investigation by Evgeny Berg for Medusa, Mersilieva responded by saying that there had been at least 200 suicides. The origin of the name Blue Whale is uncertain. Some reports say that it comes from a song by the Russian rock band Lumen. Its opening lines are, Why scream when no one hears what we're talking about? And it features a huge blue whale that can't break through the net. Others believe it to be a reference to beaching, where whales become stranded on beaches and die. The game is said to run on different social media platforms and is described as a relationship between an administrator and a participant. Over a period of 50 days, the administrator sets one task per day. The task seems innocuous to begin with, get up at 4.30 a.m., watch a horror movie, and then move on to self-harm, leading to the participant committing suicide on the final day. As professor at Russian State University for the Humanities, Alexandra Akpova found that the administrators were found to be children aged between 12 and 14 drawn to the story as it became widely reported and not, as the hysteria had intimated, predatory adults. But now, to get the juicy info of this legend from somewhere not Wikipedia, it wasn't difficult to find some information on the original internet game of death. However, there was one site that I feel compiled it pretty damn nicely for me, and well, I'm a sucker for the path of least resistance, so without further ado, 
Here's some more info on Blue Whale and how it's reportedly accessed, what it involves, the issues it caused, and more. Blue Whale is accessed through social media sites by players reaching out to administrators, who are also known as curators. These administrators and curators are supposedly the brains behind the game, and are also the prime suspects in encouraging suicide and self-harm. Budding players must request to play or take on the Blue Whale. It has been reported on Russian site VK. Players post, I want to play a game as their status in order to be contacted by administrators. Players are supposedly told to download an app, which is the game itself. There are conspiracies that once the app is downloaded, it cannot be deleted, and because it's downloaded from the internet, it contains malware viruses which can hack personal data and steal information about the players. It has been reported that curators are contacting players through Facebook groups where they can target several, if not hundreds, of people at once. These groups are private communities which express depressive content, mainly self-harm, and suicidal thoughts. Major General Alexei Moshkov, head of anti-computer crime K department in the Russian Interior Ministry, said that there were a total of 1339 suicide groups, which, combined, have an audience of 12,000, with over 200,000 posts, dated December 2017. When searching Blue Whale on sites such as YouTube, numerous people had created videos of their experiences of the game. It is unknown as to whether these are legitimate sources of people who have played the game. What does it involve, though? A group administrator, or curator, instructs players to follow a series of daily tasks in order to complete the game, brainwashing vulnerable children into fulfilling tasks over a period of 50 days. Tasks could be as simple as watching a horror film or waking up in the early hours of the morning. As time goes on, however, the game gradually takes an extremely dark turn, encouraging members to self-harm, more specifically to carve the blue whale into their skin. Some of the reported tasks range from waking up specifically at 4.20 a.m. to watch psychedelic videos sent by the curator, drawing pictures of whales, then tasks escalate to carving symbols into skin, standing on the edge of roofs, going into railways, and killing animals. The player must evidence their tasks by sending a photo to the curator to prove that they have completed it. Some of the stranger tasks include being told to talk with a cipher, and meetings to talk with a whale. There is no confirmation to what actually is meant by a cipher or rail, and what these meetings consist of. From online sources, it has been uncovered that from days 30 to 49, players are told to wake up at 4.20 a.m. every day and watch scary videos, which accumulates tiredness and decreased ability to make clear decisions. On the 50th day, players are instructed to kill themselves. Jumping off a building or in front of a train have been common specified causes of death in suspected cases. Before this one final step, players are told to delete all correspondence between themselves and the curator. Players are reportedly told that they are not allowed to speak of the game to the outside world or someone will come after them, which is explained through direct messages between the player and administrator. This is because when players sign up to the game, personal information has to be entered to sign up. This then imposes a level of threat to the players, because if they do not follow the task sent, this information is used against them. Some players have reported threats against their families for discontinuing the game. Players are told that once they begin the game, they cannot leave. During the task, the curator bullies the player by putting them down, telling them that their life is awful and it won't even get better. Their parents didn't care about them, and so... The Issues Children and teenagers are drawn to playing the game when they may be experiencing known mental health symptoms such as feeling low, depression, anxiety, lack of focus slash interest, and self-esteem issues. Their simple curiosity lures them to take on challenges having been psychologically manipulated by the curators. Children are more vulnerable online as the virtual world allows them to act freely without the restrictions of the real world. Players are said to be seeking validation from curators and other players, and made to feel that they are a part of something big and given a sense of purpose. 
There is the worry that younger children will access the content, not understanding the horrific nature of the game and what the consequences are. There is also the issue that children find it difficult to stand up to peer pressure, especially when threats are being made against them. On behalf of the government and the police, there is no control over the admins of the platform, where it came from and who created it. For children who have become a part of the game and since withdrew from its dark challenges, there is fear of judgment and lack of support. Suspects The game is said to have been created by a group of people aiming to increase suicide rates in several places. 21-year-old male Philip Budakin, who also goes by the second name Liz and Fox, is said to be the designer of the game. He has since been charged with organizing eight groups between 2013 and 2016, which promote suicide. He was reportedly a psychology student who was expelled from university. He has now confessed to the offenses and had told Russian investigators that the female victims were happy to die and were a biological waste who would cause harm to society, and that he was cleansing society. He was stated that there are 17 suicides that he knew of, which related to the game, but claimed another 28 were ready to attempt suicide. It is reported that young girls have most likely fallen in love with the creator of the game, Budakin, who showed them attention and very concerning type of love. He was jailed for three years for inciting young people to kill themselves, which officially includes two girls who played the game despite confessing to 17 known suicides. After the death of Christina Kay in July 2017, a 26-year-old postman, Ilya Sidrov Spartak, was arrested and confessed to being the online coach who brainwashed her to attempt suicide. Amidst this report, the suspect was apparently in prison when she died. On the 30th of August 2017, it has been reported that a 17-year-old Russian girl has been arrested, accused of being the mastermind behind the game. The Sun newspaper reports children as young as 14 are behind the so-called death groups. Major General Alexei Moshkov, mentioned earlier, estimates that there are 230 criminal cases, with 19 masterminds detained so far. Preventative Measures Searching the hashtag on Instagram, hashtag Blue Whale, will bring up a notification pop-up, warning users of pictures. The downfall to this is that it allows users to see posts anyway, if they click accept. The same situation occurs with Tumblr. Parents should monitor their children's social media accounts. Social media users should turn their profiles to private and not download any strange links or apps from people they don't know, of course. You should also keep an eye on your children's behavior and their routines. Make them aware of the dangers online. Check their social media for unusual posts. It's reported that players of the game may post pictures of their legs dangling over roof or building, train tracks, cuts to skin, and most evidential, a blue whale. And above all, promote support. Children need to know that people are there if they feel lost, lonely, or depressed who will provide support in a non-judgmental way. For as horrible as this time was, imagine my surprise as humans hadn't learned from the first time around and that a disturbingly similar Momo challenge existed. Well, okay, it's not really that surprising if you think about it, but still. This internet legend went on to inspire quite a few stories and even a movie or two if I recall correctly although I'm personally drawing a bit of a blank at the time of writing the script. Here's hoping I can remember by the time of recording. I didn't. <laughs> but to move on to the next eerie tale, he's rather well known, and in fact, I've alluded to him in prior episodes of Phantasmic. How could I possibly not discuss Slenderman? <laughs> I'm sure we all remember the YouTube gaming boom that happened at the same time of Sunday. After all, YouTube truly wouldn't be what it is today without it, in my humble opinion. But that's a bit of a digression. Before I continue, I'd like to make a bit of a personal recommendation for an external video and channel. Izzy... 
<laughs> made this top tier video that has an explanation of the full history of the infamous myth himself. You can find the link to that video in the description. But to tell a shortened version, every generation creates its own monsters. Folk tales tell of witches and worms in the woods. My TV infused generation feared jaws and lakes and Bloody Mary in the mirror. This generation gets its monsters from the internet. Slenderman is a pure product of electronic media. He appears in places we rarely frequent these days. Abandoned, crumbling halls, deep woods, a playground with a rickety steel jungle gym. He is a suburban ghoul with his own history and his own methodology, and of late, he has become the object of controversy due to an attack in Wisconsin during which two girls stabbed another in order to appease Slenderman's dark needs. It was a horrible story, and it underlies how little we understand about the psychology of a generation weaned on the internet, and how images can morph from fiction to fact in the course of half a decade. Slenderman's origin is surprisingly clear. Unlike most urban legends, we can trace his provenance with absolute certainty. He was born on June 8, 2009, on a forum site frequented by Photoshop pranksters. He belongs to a guy in Florida named Eric Knudsen, who has a young daughter and is surprised, as much as anything, that his demon hasn't yet been thrown into the slag heap of forgotten memes. An entire history, an entire corpus, has grown up around him in a way that would have been impossible a decade ago. He is the first pure product of the internet, a demon spawned not out of a specific place, but out of bits. Here's some of his story. Slenderman first appeared on the Something Awful forum under a thread titled Create Paranormal Images. One user, Slidebite, said you just know a couple of the good ones are going to eventually make it to paranormal websites and be used as genuine. He was right. The first image of Slenderman, of a tall, out-of-focus figure next to a tree, was accompanied by a bit of text that sounds like the dialogue from a badly translated horror game. One of two recovered photographs from the Sterling City Library blaze, notable for being taken the day which 14 children vanished and for what is referred to as the Slenderman. Deformities cited as film defects by officials. Fire at library occurred one week later, actual photograph confiscated as evidence. 1986 photographer Mary Thomas, missing since June 13, 1986. Other posters added their own interpretations of the material creating a backstory that stretched out to 16th century Germany and even to 5000 BC. The creator, Victor Serge, added a few more photos, while other visitors created their own. One particularly clever image is a modified woodcut. In the original, a skeleton takes a child from its parents, perhaps into death. In the modified version, the skeleton has long arms and legs, and its misshapen skull is hidden by the eaves of the house. Over the intervening months, something awful posters and fanfiction enthusiasts added to the corpus. He gained specific definition, courtesy of a poster on Yahoo Answers in 2011, two years after the original posts. The Slender Man is a supernatural creature that is described as appearing as normal human being, but he is described as being eight feet tall and he has vectors or extra appendages that are described to be as sharp as swords. The creature is known to stalk humans and cause many disappearances. He is described as a shadow creature that has a missing face. The creature fits into many mythologies and legends from nations such as Germany and Celts, which bring up the possibility that he could be real. A man named Victor Serge found this legend and made his own version of it, which he called Slenderman. The Slenderman is not exactly evil according to mythology, but Victor Serge's version shows him as an evil creature that stalks humans to kill. In mythology, he was actually trying to save you from a painful death by taking you to the underworld early. Slenderman is a product of this century. He appears and havoc follows. He murders in undescribed ways, or he compels others to murder. He is a dark god in an age of digital media, and he fills the empty place between the news and the unknown. Interestingly, Slenderman was born of the previous generation's boogeyman, 
From a long interview with Thunderman's creator, Knudsen, aka Victor Surge. I was mostly influenced by H.P. Lovecraft, Stephen King, specifically his short stories, the surreal imaginings of William S. Burroughs, and a couple of games of the survival horror genre, Silent Hill and Resident Evil. I feel the most direct influences were Zach Parsons' That Insidious Beast and Stephen King's short story The Mist. The S.A. tale regarding the Wraith reports of so-called shadow people, mothman, and the mad gasser of Matoon. I use these to formulate something whose motivations can barely be comprehended and whose general unease and terror in a general population. The key word there is terror. Slenderman does not directly kill his victims. Instead, he encourages others to in order to please him. Interestingly, the places he haunts are all but gone now. Thanks to breathless news coverage of murder and mayhem, children are rarely allowed to wander in woods alone or play in abandoned buildings. In fact, that he exists at all is a testament to the eerie pull of these places. He's the ghost in the parking lot, patrolled by the board guards and CCTV cameras. He's the story that keeps you up at night in the center of a city full of 8 million people. He's not Osama Bin Laden or your father's PTSD, but is instead something far easier to understand. In a world that no longer harbors nameless dread, in which every monster has a name and GPS coordinates, he is a welcome refuge into the imagination. One popular video game created around the mythos involves walking around a darkened forest surrounded by a chain leaf fence. All you have to do is find eight pieces of paper tacked to nearby trees. As you find the papers, the buzzing of crickets and the rustling of the photorealistic trees changes to a steady pounding. Slenderman is a foot. He doesn't kill you. You simply disappear in a cloud of electronic snow. Forums and video series were filled with fanfiction and content. The quality varies widely, but it's grown oddly popular. One popular web series, Marble Hornets, is described as found footage of a man haunted by Slenderman. Most of the footage is mundane B-roll of woods and country roads. Then, every so often, Slenderman appears by fuzzing out the screen or pushing one of the characters into a violent coughing fit. There are no demons screaming gotcha. Instead, you get an endless, nameless dread. Wanting to find out the draw, I asked on the forums and chat rooms for input on the phenomenon. One Reddit fan, MLPTTM, wrote, I like him because most creepypastas try to scare you with blood, gore, and if you're lucky, hyper-realistic blood. Slenderman scared me with psychological horror, making me scared of fields, trees, and sometimes nothing. He has made me as paranoid as I've been in my life, and I love the thrill. His design is simple and terrifying because it can make him visible in a field or invisible in a forest. His humanoid figure makes him seem real, like him stalking you can happen. I think the biggest thing that makes him interesting is that nobody has any full idea what happens when he gets you. Another poster said that they liked Slenderman because he was relentless. Slender hunts you, but he doesn't bang on your door, claw at your walls, or howl at the moon. He's just there, standing, waiting in the corner of your eyes. It's bogus, you know it. You're seeing things, because you're just tired as shit. Or it's Jake, pulling your leg. Then it gets real. You have to get away. Despite your best efforts, Slender is still there, always standing, always waiting, always watching. Sadly, he's also taken on a life of his own. To understand what Slenderman has become of late, all you have to do is watch a Twitter stream of mentions. In 2014, Slenderman was now Slendy, a quasi-comical, quasi-serious figure that has taken on a life of his own. The feed is full of game walkthroughs and links to creepypasta, essentially fanfiction, as well as bits of dog girl that sounds like early Eminem lyrics passed through Hogwarts. Black is Slendy's suit, the wiki is the creepypasta root. Cold is Jeff's knife, ending your life. Red is blood, crimson warm flood. Courtesy of Creepypasta Lover. 
Lundy is a sort of goblin that posters use to scare themselves. Sadly, he's also become a focal point for madness. On May 31st, two 12-year-old girls in Waukesha, Wisconsin, stabbed a third girl nearly to death. The girls who called their plot Stabby Stab Stab said it was intended as a sacrifice to Sunderman. Authorities are trying the pair as adults pending a mental evaluation. The tragedy here is that all the girls' lives are damaged now, even potentially ruined. The girls believed Slendy would appear to them if they killed in his name. They also believed he had threatened them and their families and could read their minds. Children have always had fanciful flights of imagination. These claims sound much like the Salem witch hunts of the 1690s when young girls accused each other of writing with the devil. The resulting panics led to countless false confessions and over 20 executions. The same could probably happen here. Then, a few days later, around the anniversary of Slenderman's creation, a teen in Cincinnati attacked her mother. The teen, who had a history of mental illness, was obsessed with the character. The lack of detail in this and the previous case points more towards mental illness than anything else. Slenderman then became a focus for the mania that forced these girls to act out violently. Thus far, no more reports of Slenderman-related violence have surfaced. The creators and maintainers of the mythos are adamant about their disapproval. We're not teaching children to believe in a fictional monster, nor are we teaching them to be violent, wrote Creepy Monster moderator David Morales. I am deeply saddened by the tragedy in Wisconsin, and my heart goes out to the families and those affected by this terrible act, said Slenderman creator and Eric Knudsen. I attempted to contact him for the story, but to no avail. Where the Slenderman mythos goes from here is anyone's guess. He's a new villain, a new scapegoat, and a new demon. He won't be the last of his kind, but he is the first pure product of the internet. A digital demon that haunts websites and sometimes spills over into the real world. Thankfully, no one has yet been killed in his honor. A 12-year-old Wisconsin victim is recovering and doing well. In a statement, the girl's parents wrote, our family would like to thank everyone who has supported our daughter on her miraculous road to recovery. Our little girl has received thousands of purple hearts from numerous countries and from most continents. We simply cannot put into words how grateful we are for the prayers, packages, and heartfelt messages. We are overwhelmed by the outpouring of love and support. They added, Together as a family, we continue to adjust to our new normal. Though many days consist of medical appointments and rehabilitation, recently she and her father enjoyed a daddy-daughter night at the movies and thoroughly enjoyed a Disney film. It also included, after much persistence, a stop for a much-deserved treat in the snack area. Knudsen, for his part, stopped development of the character a few years ago. I don't spend a whole lot of active time on the internet, since I usually have a lot of real-life stuff going on, he said. Now, of course, he isn't real, but the Slenderman himself lives on in infamy online. He served as a new base for modern monsters, and as the article I just read opened with, every generation creates its own monsters. But I feel it's time to discuss the one that amazed me to discover continued even well into 2020. Quote, Ben Drowned, originally published as Haunted Majora's Mask Cartridge, is a three-part multimedia alternate reality game, ARG, web serial and web series created by Alexander D. Jaduzabal Hall. Originating as a creepypasta based on the 2000 action-adventure game The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, and published by Hall from 2010 to 2020 with a hiatus in between, the series is known for creating many of the common tropes and themes of creepypasta that are used nowadays for subverting themes from the Legend of Zelda series. The series concluded on October 31st, 2020. End quote. And now, I'd actually just like to read the original story for you all. Okay, X, I need your help with this. This is not a copy pasta, this is a long read. I feel like my safety or well being could very well depend on this. This is video game related, specifically Majora's Mask, and this is the creepiest shit that has ever happened to me in my entire life. 
Having said that, I recently moved into my dorm room, starting as a sophomore in college, and a friend of mine gave me his old Nintendo 64 to play. I was stoked, to say the least. I could finally play all those old games of my youth that I hadn't touched in at least a decade. This Nintendo 64 came with one yellow controller and a rather shoddy copy of Super Smash Bros. And while beggars can't be choosers, needless to say, it didn't take long until I became bored of beating up level 9 CPUs. That weekend, I decided to drive around a few neighborhoods about 20 minutes or so off campus, hitting up the local garage sales, hoping to score on some good deals from ignorant parents. I ended up picking up a copy of Pokemon Stadium, GoldenEye, fuck yeah, F-Zero, and two other controllers for $2. Satisfied, I began to drive out of the neighborhood when one last house caught my attention. I still have no idea why it did. There were no cars there, and only one table was set up with random junk on it. But something sort of drew me there. I usually trust my gut on these things, so I got out of the car and I was greeted by an old man. His outward appearance was, for lack of a better word, displeasing. It was odd. If you asked me to tell you why I thought he was displeasing, I couldn't really pinpoint anything. There was just something about him that put me on edge. I can't explain it. All I can tell you is that if it wasn't in the middle of the afternoon and there were other people within shouting distance, I would not have even thought of approaching this man. He flashed a crooked smile at me and asked what I was looking for, and immediately I noticed that he must be blind in one of his eyes. His right eye had that glazed over look about it. I forced myself to look to his left eye instead, trying not to offend, and asked him if he had any old video games. I was already wondering how I could politely excuse myself from the situation when he would tell me he had no idea what a video game was, but to my surprise, he said he had a few ones in an old box. He assured me he'd be back in a jiffy and turned to head back into the garage. As I watched him hobble away, I couldn't help but notice what he was selling on the table. Littered across his table were rather peculiar paintings. Various artworks that looked like ink blots that a psychiatrist might show you. Curious, I looked through them, and it was obvious why no one was visiting this guy's garage sale. These weren't exactly aesthetically pleasing. As I came to the last one, for some reason, it looked almost like Majora's Mask. The same heart-shaped body with little spikes protruding outward. Initially, I just thought that since I was secretly hoping to find that game in all of these garage sales, some Freudian bullshit was projecting itself onto the ink blots. but given the events that happened afterward, I'm not so sure now. I should have asked the man about it. I wish I would have asked the man about it. After staring at the Majora-shaped blot, I looked up and the old man was suddenly there again, arms linked in front of me, smiling at me. I'll admit, I jumped out of reflex, and I laughed nervously as he handed me a Nintendo 64 cartridge. It was the standard gray color, except that someone had written Majora on it in black permanent marker. I got butterflies in my stomach as I realized what a coincidence this was and asked him how much he wanted for it. The old man smiled at me and told me that I could have it for free, that it used to belong to a kid who was about my age that didn't live here anymore. There was something weird about how the man phrased that, but I didn't really pay any attention to it then. I was too caught up in not only finding this game, but getting it for free. I reminded myself to be a bit skeptical since this looked like a pretty shady cartridge and there's no guarantee it would work, but then the optimist inside me interjected that maybe it was some kind of beta version or pirated version of the game and that was all I needed to be back on Cloud9. I thanked the man, and the man smiled at me and wished me well, saying goodbye then. At least, that's what it sounded like to me. All the way in the car ride home, I had a nagging doubt that the man had said something else. My fears were confirmed when I booted up the game, to my surprise it worked just fine. And there was one save file named simply Ben. Goodbye, Ben. He was saying goodbye, Ben. I felt bad for the man. Obviously a grandparent and obviously going senile, and I, for some reason or another, 
reminded him of his grandson, Ben. Out of curiosity, I looked at the save file. Eyeballing it, I could tell that he was pretty far in the game. He had almost all the masks and three-fourths remains of the bosses. I noticed that he had used an owl statue to save his game. It was on day three and by the stone tower temple with hardly an hour left before the moon would crash. I remember thinking that it was a shame that he had come so close to beating the game, but he never finished it. I made a new file named Link, out of tradition, and started the game, ready to relive my childhood. For such a shady looking game cartridge, I was impressed with how smoothly it ran. Literally just like a retail copy of the game save, for a few minor hiccups here and there. Like textures being where they shouldn't be, random flashes of cutscenes at odd intervals, but nothing too bad. However, the only thing that I thought was a little unnerving was that at times, the NPCs would call me Link, and at other times they would call me Ben. I figured it was just a bug, a fluke in the programming, causing our files to get mixed up or something. It did kind of creep me out though after a while, and it was around after I had beaten the Woodfall Temple that I regrettably went into the save files and deleted Ben. I had intended to preserve the file just out of respect of the game's original owner, it's not like I needed two files anyway, hoping that that would solve the problem. It did and it didn't. Now NPCs wouldn't call me anything. Where my name should be in the dialogue, there was just a blank space. My save file name was still called Link, though. Frustrated and with homework to do, I put the game down for a day. I started playing the game again last night, getting the lens of truth and working my way towards completing the Snowhead Temple. Now, some of you more hardcore Majora's Mask players know about the fourth day glitch. For those who don't, you can just Google it, but the gist of it is that right as the clock is about to hit midnight on the final day, you talk to the astronomer and look through the telescope. If you time it right, the countdown disappears and you essentially have another day to finish whatever you are doing. Deciding to do the glitch to try and finish the Snowhead Temple, I happened to get it right on the first try and the time counter at the bottom disappeared. However, when I pressed B to exit the telescope, instead of being greeted by the astronomer, I found myself in the Bajora However, when I pressed B to exit the telescope, instead of being greeted by the astronomer, I found myself in the Majora boss fight room at the end of the game. The trippy boxed-in arena, staring at Skull Kid hovering above me. There was no sound, just him floating in the air above me. And the background music, which was regular for the area, but still creepy. Immediately, my palms began to sweat. This was definitely not normal. Skull Kid never appeared here. I tried moving around the area, and no matter where I went, Skull Kid would always be facing me, looking at me, not saying anything. Nothing would happen, though, and this kept up for around 60 seconds. I thought the game had bugged or something, but I was beginning to doubt that very much. I was about to reach for the reset button when text appeared on my screen. Not sure why, but you apparently had a reservation. I instantly recognized that text. You get that message when you get the room key from Anju at the stockpot in. But why was it playing here? I refused to entertain the notion that it was almost as if the game was trying to communicate with me. I started to navigate the room again, testing to see if that was some sort of trigger that enabled me to interact with something here. And I realized how stupid I was to even think that someone could program the game like this was absurd. Sure enough, 15 seconds later, another message appeared on the screen, and again, like the first one, it was already a pre-existing phrase. Go to the lair of the temple's boss? Yes or no? I paused for a second, contemplating what I should press and how the game would react. But I realized that I couldn't select no. Taking a deep breath, I pressed yes, and the screen faded to white, with the words dawn of a new day and the subtext uh, beneath it, where I was ported to filled me with the most intense sense of dread and impending fear I had ever experienced. The only way I can describe the way I felt here is having the feeling of inexplicable depression 
on a profound scale. I am normally not a depressed person, but the way I felt here was a feeling that I didn't even know existed. It was such a twisted, powerful presence that seemed to wash over me. I appeared in some kind of weird Twilight Zone version of Clock Town. I walked out of the clock tower, as you normally do when you start from day one, only to find that all of the inhabitants were gone. Usually with the fourth day glitch, you can still find the guards and the dog that runs around outside the tower. This time, they were all gone. What replaced them was the ominous feeling that there was something out there, in the same area as me, and that it was watching me. I had four hearts to my name and the heroes, though, but at this point, I wasn't even considered for my avatar. I felt that I personally was in some kind of danger. Perhaps the most chilling thing was the music. It was a song of healing, ripped straight from the game itself, but played in reverse. The music would get louder, building up so as if you should expect something to pop out at you, but nothing ever did, and the constant loop began to wear out my mental state. Every now and then, I would hear the faint laugh of the happy masked salesman in the background. Just quiet enough so that I wasn't sure if I was hearing things, but just loud enough to keep me determined to find him. I looked in all four zones of Clock Town, only to find nothing. No one. Dexters were missing. West Clock Town had me walking on air. The entire area felt broken. Hopelessly broken. As the reverse song of healing repeated for what must have been the 50th time, I just remember standing in the middle of South Clock Town, realizing that I had never felt so alone in a video game before. As I walked through the ghost town, I don't know whether it was a combination of the out-of-place textures and the atmosphere, and the haunting melody of the once peaceful and soothing song being butchered and distorted, but I was literally on the edge of tears and I had no idea why. I hardly ever cry. Something had gripped me here, and this powerful sense of depression that was both bored and crippling. I tried leaving Clock Town, but every time I attempted to zone out, the screen would fade to black and I would just zone into another part of Clock Town. I tried playing my ocarina. I wanted to escape, and I did not want to be here, but every time I played the Song of Time or Song of Storing, it would only say, Your notes echo far, but nothing happens. At this point, it was obvious the game didn't want me to leave, but I had no idea why it was keeping me here. I didn't want to go inside the buildings. I felt that I would be too vulnerable there to whatever I was terrified of. I don't know why, but I came up with the idea that maybe if I drowned myself in the laundry pool, I could spawn somewhere else and leave this place. As I zoned in and ran towards the pool, that's when I happened. Link grabbed his head, and the screen flashed for a brief moment of the happy masked salesman smiling at me. Not Link, me. The Skull Kid's scream playing in the background, and when the screen returned, I was staring at the Link statue from playing the song Elegy of Emptiness. I screamed as the thing just stared back at me with that haunting facial expression. I turned around and ran out and back into South Clock Town. And to my horror, the fucking statue followed me, and the only way I can compare this is like the Weeping Angels from Doctor Who. Every so often, at random intervals, the animation would play of the statue appearing behind me. It was like the thing was chasing me, or... I don't even want to say it. Haunting me. By this point, I was on the verge of hysterics, but not even once did the thought of turning off the console occur to me. I don't know why I was so wrapped up in it. The terror felt all so real. I tried to shake the statue, but it would literally appear right behind me every single time. Link started to begin to make weird animations I had never seen him do before. He would flail his arms around or spasm randomly and the screen would cut to the happy mask salesman smiling again for a brief moment before I was face to face with that fucking statue again. I ended up running into the Swords Master's dojo and ran to the back. I don't know why, but in my panic, I just wanted some kind of assurance that I'm not alone here. To my dismay, I found no one, but as I turned to leave, the statue cornered me in the cubby in the back. 
I tried attacking the statue with my sword, but to no avail. Confused and backed into a corner, I just stared at the statue, waiting for it to kill me. Suddenly, the screen flashed again to the happy mask salesman, and Link turned to face my screen, standing upright mirroring the statue, looking at me along with his coffee. Literally staring at me. Whatever was left on the fourth wall was completely shattered while I ran out of the dojo terrified. Suddenly, the game warped me to an underground tunnel and the reverse song of healing queued up again as I was given a brief moment of rest before the statue started appearing behind me again. This time, aggressively. I could only take a few steps before it would summon behind me again. I hurriedly made my way out of the tunnel and appeared in Southern Clock Town. As I ran aimlessly in a sheer panic, Suddenly a read had screamed and the screen faded to black as dawn of a new day and I appeared again. The screen faded in and I was standing on top of Clock Tower with Skull Kid hovering over me again, silent. I looked up and the moon was back, looming just meters above my head. The Skull Kid just stared at me hauntingly with that fucking mask. A new song was playing. The Stone Tower Temple theme played in reverse. In some sort of desperate attempt, I equipped my bow and fired off a shot at the Skull Kid. And it actually hit him, and he played an animation of him reeling back. I fired again, and on the third arrow, a text box appeared saying, That won't do you any good, hee <laughs> hee. I was picked up off the ground, levitated upwards on my back, then Link screamed as he burst into flames, instantly killing him. I jumped when this happened. I had never seen this move used by anyone in the game, and Skullkid himself didn't have any moves. As the death scream played, my lifeless body still burning. The Skullkid laughed and the screen faded to black, only to have me reappear in the same place. I decided to charge him, but the same thing happened. Link's body was lifted off the ground by some unknown force, and he immediately burst into flames, killing him again. This time during the death scream, the faint sounds of the reverse song of healing could be heard. My third and final try, I noticed that there was no music playing this time, but all there was was eerie silence. I remembered that in the original encounter with the Skull Kid, you were supposed to use the ocarina to either travel back in time or summon the giant. I attempted to play the song of time, but before I could hit the last note, Link's body once again horrifically exploded into flames and he died. As the death screen neared its end, it began to chug as if the cartridge was trying to process a lot of something. When the screen came to, it was the same scene as the first three times, except this time, Link was lying on the ground dead in a position I had never seen in the game before. His head tilted towards the camera, the skull kid floating above him. I couldn't move, couldn't press any buttons, and all I could do was stare at Link's dead body. After around 30 seconds of this, the game simply fades out with the message, You've met with a terrible fate, haven't you? Before kicking you out to the title screen. Upon getting back to the title screen and starting again, I noticed that my save file was no longer there. Instead of Link, it was replaced with Your Turn. Your Turn had three hearts, zero masks, and no items. I selected your turn, and immediately when I did, I was returned to the clock tower rooftop scene of my Link dead and the Skull Kid hovering over, the Skull Kid's voice laughing, looping over and over again. I quickly hit the reset button, and when the game booted up again, there was one more save file added, below your turn, entitled Ben. Ben's save file is right back where it was before I deleted it, at the stone tower temple with the moon almost crashing. I turned the game off at that point. Not superstitious, but this is way too fucked up even for me. I haven't played it at all today. Hell, I didn't even get any sleep last night. I kept hearing the reverse song of healing music in my head and just remembering the sense of dread I felt exploring Clock Town. I drove back to the old man's house today and asked him some questions with a buddy of mine. No way I was going there alone. Only to find that there's a for sale sign in the front yard, and when I rang the door, no one was home. So now I'm back here, writing down the rest of my thoughts and recording what happened. 
Sorry if some of this is grammatical errors and whatnot, and I'm running on no sleep here. I'm terrified of this game, even more so now that I relived it a second time, writing this all down. And I feel like there's still more to it than meets the eye. But that there's something calling me to investigate this further. I think Ben is something in this equation, but I don't know what. If I could get a hold of the old man, then I would be able to find some answers. I need another day or so to recuperate before tackling this game again. It's already taken a toll on my sanity, I feel like, but next time I do this, I'm going to be recording my footage all the way through. The idea to record only came to me towards the end, so you see the last few minutes of what I saw, including Skull Kid and the Elegy statue, but it's on YouTube here. I'm going to stay in this thread for a little while longer before I fall asleep to answer any questions you guys might have, or hopefully listen to your ideas or theories to help me shed some light onto this, or maybe things I should try to do. I think I'm going to play Ben's file tomorrow to see what happens. Maybe I was supposed to do that all along. I don't believe in paranormal shit, but this is a little fucked up. But maybe this Ben guy is just a really good hacker slash programmer. I don't really want to think of, about the alternatives if he isn't. At the end of the copy-paste, I'm hoping that maybe this is some kind of running gag the developers had and that other people have gotten gag or hacked copies of the game like this. This just really scares me. Sorry it took me so long, guys. I'm back. I'm gonna post what happened and link the video footage, but last night everything got too real for me. I think I'm done messing around with this. I passed out pretty much immediately after making that thread, but last night, that elegy of emptiness statue, I had a dream about it. I dreamt that it was following me in my dream, but I would be minding my own business when I'd feel my neck hairs stand up on end. I would turn around that thing, that horrible, lifeless statue, would be staring at me with those empty eyes, nearly inches away. In my dream, I remember calling it Ben, and never before had I had a dream that I could remember so vividly. The important thing is, I did get some sleep, I suppose. Today, putting off playing the game as long as I could, I drove back up to that neighborhood to see if the old man came back. As I expected, the car was still gone and no one was home. As I was walking back to my car, the man next door mowing the grass killed the power to his lawnmower and asked me if I was looking for someone. I told him that I was looking to talk to the old man that lived here, to which he told me what I already knew. He was moving. Trying a different avenue, I asked if the old man had any family or relatives I could talk to. I discovered that this old man had never been married, nor did he have any children or grandchildren through adoption. Starting to become worried, I asked one final question, one that I should have asked him from the beginning. Who was Ben? The man's expression turned grim, and I learned that four doors down around eight years ago on April 23rd, the man informed me that it was the same day as his anniversary. That's how he knew the specific date. There was an accident with a young boy named Ben in the neighborhood. Shortly after his parents moved, and despite any further attempts to talk to the man to get more information, he wouldn't divulge anything else. I went back and started playing again. I loaded up the game and immediately I jumped at the title screen where the mask flies by. The sound that played was not the normal whoosh sound. It was something much more higher pitched. Press start, bracing for the worst, but just like two nights ago, the files Your Turn and Ben were displayed. Truth be told, I looked at the Ben file earlier. It seems to fluctuate between displaying the owl save and not. I brought up the Ben file, hesitated for a moment, noticing that the stats were not the same as they originally were two days ago. It seemed like he had already completed the Stone Tower Temple this time. Summoning my courage, I selected it. Immediately, I was thrusted into complete chaos. Sure enough, I was outside Stone Tower Temple, but that's about all that was expected. The zone itself wasn't called Stone Tower Temple, but rather... Stone and immediately a dialogue box of complete gibberish that I couldn't make out greeted me. Link's body was distorted, his back was cocked violently to the side where his posture was permanently disfigured. 
Link's expression was dull, almost monotonous. He had an expression on his face that I didn't recognize before. It was a blank look, as if he was dead. As Link stood there, his body spasmed irregularly back and forth. I examined what had become my avatar and noticed it had a C button item I had never seen before. Some kind of note, but pressing it did nothing. Sounds played back and forth that I didn't recognize from the game. Almost demonic in nature, and there was some kind of high pitched yip or some kind of laugh or something playing in the background. I had all of two minutes to take in the environment before another one of those fucking Elegy of Emptiness statues was summoned, and immediately after, I was cut into the dawn of a new day screen. Except this time it was without the eye uh, subject. I was a Deku scrub in Clocktown. The scene would normally play after the first time you travel back in time. Paddle would say, well, What just happened? As if everything has. But instead of saying start it over, she finished her remark in broken text as the laugh of the happy mask salesman played in the background. I was put back in control of my character, but from a fucked up camera angle. I was looking from behind the door to the clock tower, watching my avatar run around as a Deku scrub. Seeing as how I really had no place to go because I couldn't see anything, I begrudgingly went inside the door. There, I was greeted by the happy masked salesman who simply told me, You've met with a terrible fate, haven't you? Before the screen whited out. I was in Termina Field as a human again. I might as well not have been playing the same game anymore. I was being warped around and there was no sign of a day clock or anything. It took a moment to get my bearings as I looked around the field, and immediately I could tell that this was not normal. There were no enemies, and a twisted version of the Happy Mask Salesman theme was playing. I decided to run towards Woodfall before I noticed the gathering of three figures off to the side, one of them being Epona. As I approached them, to my horror, I saw the Happy Mask Salesman, the Skull Kid, and the Elegy of Emptiness statue just standing there. I figured maybe they were bugged out, but by now I told myself that I should know better. Nevertheless, I approached them carefully and found that the Skull Kid was playing some kind of idle animation on loop, same with Epona, and the Elegy of Emptiness statue was doing what it had been doing all along, just standing there eerily. It was the Happy Mask Salesman that scared me more profoundly than the other two. He too was idle. Wearing that shit-eating grin, but wherever I moved, his head slowly turned and followed me. I had not engaged in any dialogue with him, nor was I in combat with him. Yet his head still continued to follow my movements. Reminded of my first encounter with the Skull Kid on top of Clock Tower, I pulled out my ocarina, to which the game played the ding sound when you're supposed to play your ocarina, and tried a song I hadn't played yet. The Happy Mask Salesman own song and the song that had been playing on loop back in day four. The song of Healing. I finished playing the song, and as I did, an ear piercing streak blasted on my TV. The sky immediately started flashing. The Happy Mask Salesman's twisted theme song sped up, intensifying the fear inside me, and Link exploded into flames and died. Three figures stayed lit up during my death screen as they watched my lifeless body burn. I can't describe to you how sudden and terrifying the transition from eerie to terror is. You're going to have to watch the video if you want to see it firsthand. That same fear that caused me to lose sleep two days ago started to hit me again as I was met with the text. You've met with a terrible fate, haven't you? The third time. There has to be some kind of meaning behind that. I had little time to ponder as I was immediately given another small cutscene of transforming into a Zora, and now I found myself in Great Temple Bay. Hesitant but curious to see what the game had in store for me, I slowly made my way toward the beach, where I found Epona. I wondered why the game had decided to put her here. Was the game implying she was trying to get a drink? Able to take the mask off, I decided that riding the steed wasn't the reason she was placed there. Suddenly, I realized that Epona kept neighing, and the way that she was angled made it look like she was trying to signal a point to me off in the distance. It was a hunch, but I dove into Great Bay and started swimming. Sure enough, I almost missed it. I found something at the bottom of the ocean. 
one last elegy of emptiness statue. I went down to examine it and suddenly my Zora began doing a choking animation I had never seen Zora do before. Which didn't even make sense because Zoras can breathe underwater. Regardless, my character choked to death and died, and, and once again, the statue was the only thing that highlighted my death. I didn't respawn this time. I was booted back to the main menu as if I restarted the console. The press start screen was before me. I knew the only reason why it would put me here was because the save files had changed again. Taking a deep breath, I pressed start and I was right. The new save files told me about Ben. Now it made sense why the statue appeared when I tried to go to the laundry pool. The game must have anticipated how I would have tried to escape the day for Clocktown. The two safe files told me his fate. As I expected, Ben was dead. He had drowned. The game obviously isn't through with me. It taunts me with this new safe file. It wants me to keep playing. It wants me to go further. But I'm done with this shit. I'm not touching any more of the files. This is already way too horrifying for me, and I don't even believe in the paranormal. But I'm running out of explanations. Why would someone send me this message? I don't understand it. I just get too depressed thinking about this. Footage is up here for those who want to see it and try to analyze it. Maybe there's some kind of coded message in the gibberish or something symbolic in what I went through. I'm too emotionally and mentally drained to fuck with it anymore. I'm trying to get a hold of a camera so I can take a picture of the cartridge, but I have a feeling that once I do that, then those same people will not be content with having an unexplainable event and want me to jump through more hoops to prove. I promise you that I will, but just for the rest of the day, I just want to distance myself from this thing and recuperate. I'll answer all of your questions and give you all the pictures I can tomorrow. Some of you guys may give me shit for this, but... You can't imagine how taxing this is for me emotionally. It's one thing to see this footage and read what I have to say. It's another when you're playing this by yourself and it's like the game is actually trying to reach out to you personally. Having said that, here's the link. Maybe there's more to analyze here. Hopefully we can figure this out with the, the need of additional playthroughs. I really don't think I can keep subjecting myself to this, guys. I don't have a long string of paragraphs for this one. I know it's early in the morning. Stayed up all night, can't sleep, don't care if people see this, that's not the point. I just want the word to spread so I don't suffer for nothing. I've lost the will to type about this. The less I dwell on this, the better. I think the video just speaks for itself. I did what you guys told me to do. I did the Elegy of Emptiness song at the first prompt by the game I was given. I think that's what the game or Ben... Jesus Christ, I can't believe I'm even humoring the absurd idea that he exists in the game. ...wanted me to do. He's following me now, not just in the game. He's in my dreams. I see him all the time, behind my back just watching me. I haven't gone to any of my classes. I've stayed in my dorm room with the windows closed and blinds shut. That way I know he can't watch me. But he still gets me when I play. When I play, he can still see me. The game is scaring me now. It talked to me for the first time, not just using text that's already in the game. It spoke to me. Talked to me. It referenced Ben. It talked to me. I don't know what it means. I don't know what it wants. I never wanted this. I just want my old life back. Stuff like this doesn't happen to people like me. I'm just a kid, not even old enough to drink yet. It's not fair. I want to go home. I want to see my parents again. I'm so far away from home at the school. I just want to hug my mom again. I just want to forget that statue's horrible blank face. My original game file is back, just the way I left it before it was gone. I don't want to play anymore. I feel like something bad will happen if I don't, but that's impossible. It's a video game. Haunted or not, it can't hurt me, right? Seriously, though, it can't, right? That's what I keep telling myself, but every time I think about it, I'm not so sure. Let me just clear things up. I know you guys are worried, but Reducible is okay. He finished moving out today, and he said he's going back home. He's just taking the semester off. I'm not really sure what's happened. 
I have a vague idea, but you guys probably know more than I do. I am Deducible's roommate, and obviously I know something that was wrong with him for a few days now. He stayed in his room all the time, fell out of contact with literally all of his friends, but I'm pretty sure he hadn't been eating hardly anything. After the second day, I couldn't stay in there anymore, so I've been crashing out of Buddy's place, only coming into my room to get stuff that I need. I tried talking to him several times, but he would cut me off or keep the conversation brief when I asked him about his strange behavior. It's like he was convinced something was hunting him. Yesterday, I came to grab my philosophy book, and he approached me, looking awful like horrible bags under his eyes. He handed me a flash drive and gave me specific instructions. He told me that he needs me to do one last favor for him. He finally explained to me what has been going on, gave me an account info to his YouTube account, and he gave me instructions on how to post this with his name code on specifically this board. Apparently he said you guys had been helping him along the way and you deserve to see the end of it. He told me that he's getting away from here that it lured him to play it again instead of trying to change things, and that he shouldn't have done that, and to upload the footage and inform people what happened. I told him that he could do it himself, and he got this wild look in his eye and told me that he is never looking at that game again. And that's the last thing he said to me. He never even said bye when his parents came to pick him up. I was hoping I'd at least get a chance to meet his parents when they picked him up, but they were in and out so quick I never saw him. I honestly can't tell you what happened. When he spoke, he was kind of hard to understand him, and his fucked up appearance really distracted me. On the flash drive, there was the footage of the game last night. A text documented with his name and password for YouTube, and a third document called truth.text, containing what he told me were his notes that he'd taken. He told me that this meant everything to him, and that I followed his instructions exactly. Normally I wouldn't be so to the letter for a quest over a fucking video game, but the way he spoke and the way he looked made me know that this was really serious. And I'm gonna honor that. I've had this video since yesterday, but had to have someone help me use Pinnacle. That's not really my forte. But after watching it, I had to go back through and look at all of the other YouTube videos on his account to realize what was going on, and even then, I'm really confused. The video I'm releasing tonight, the truth.txt, will be released on September 15th, just like he requested. I don't know why he wants to wait for his notes to be published, but after what he's been through, I'll honor that request. I haven't dared peek at it yet, so the first time I see it will be the first time you see it. Out of respect to my friend. To answer your questions, no, I haven't tried calling him yet. I think I'll give him a call tomorrow to see if he's okay or not. He should have gotten back home by now. About the video. In this video, I cut straight to when he loaded the Ben file in the game. Looking back, I realized that Jaducible left the save file screen in because it said different names sometimes. So my bad for that. But... All it said this time was the same at the end of the last video. Link and Ben, nothing different. It wasn't there when he played it, but it looks to me like in the beginning when he first spawns, he's testing out his equipment or seeing what items he has or something. Because apparently they've changed randomly before. He really wanted you guys to see this, and the video starts then. After that, I just think the game got too personal for him. Here's the link. Honesty is the best policy. This, once upon a time for humans, was enough of a scare. And yet, to see that it started its third arc in 2020? Genuinely surprising for a demon who wasn't here the whole time, I must say. I'm glad to see that this one thrived for as long as it did, and as well as it did, truly. That said, I do believe that we are at the end of this week's episode. It's been an absolute pleasure to share these legends with you all tonight. Truly, thank you for taking this little stroll down memory lane with me. <laughs> I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. And if you did, please feel free to subscribe, follow, or whatever it is at the platform you're tuning in on lets you do. Once I reach 500 of you little phantoms, I'll be sharing one of my own personal paranormal stories. And trust me, you won't want to miss it. <laughs> Now, if you have any scary stories that you'd like to share with me, 
You can at me on any of my socials or send an email to luckymisfortune at gmail.com. That's L-U-C-K-Y-M-S-F-O-R-T-U-N-E at gmail. And links to all of this can be found in the description. While you're checking that out, you'll also notice links to Patreon, OnlyFans, Coffee, and even a throne wish list. While financial support isn't necessary to be a fan of the show, it's always much appreciated. And with that, I think it's time I bid you all a good night. <laughs> Stay hydrated, take care of yourselves, and above all else, don't forget to close your doors. Honestly, I don't know how you haven't been noticing all the rats, spiders, shadows, and demons entering your home while you slept. <laughs> Although while I'm here, mind if I crawl into your bed? I'm awful tired. <laughs> good night. Mwah.